Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Marina stood long in front of the bathroom mirror, gazing into her reflection. She felt she looked much worse than the last time she had carefully examined herself in the mirror. Now, wrinkles deepened around her eyes, nasolabial folds became much deeper and somehow longer, and gray hair was reappearing at her temples. My God! What a horror, the woman murmured and turned her face away. How did it happen that Marina aged so much? She wasn't even 40 yet. She had recently turned 38, but her reflection in the mirror suggested she looked 7 to 10 years older. Mom, are you going to be long there? Isabella wants to use the toilet. Someone knocked on the door, and Marina came to her senses. It was 8 o'clock in the morning, and they had to leave the house at 8.40. Grabbing a towel, she quickly brushed her teeth, rinsed her face, and applied cream, lamenting that she again didn't have time to apply a fabric face mask. I never have time for myself, Marina thought angrily, already leaving the bathroom. In the corridor, her children were lined up, 16-year-old Juliana, 10-year-old Antonio, and 5-year-old Isabella. You could have rinsed there for a hundred years, Juliana said harshly and, pushing her mother with her shoulder, went into the bathroom, dragging her younger sister by the hand. Isabella, hurry up, or we'll be late for kindergarten. Thank your mother for that. Thank you, Isabella squeaked, seemingly not understanding exactly what her older sister had made her thank her mother for, whether for the chance to be late for kindergarten or for Marina finally leaving the bathroom. Marina sighed heavily. Communication with Juliana was becoming more burdensome day by day. The teenage daughter had become very rude to her mother. She ignored Marina's opinion and got irritated whenever Marina opened her mouth to express her point of view. As if you would understand, Juliana snorted and made a displeased face. My dear, I'm not yet 100 years old and long past 16, Marina tried to reason with her elder daughter, although she saw well that her words had no effect on Juliana. She only rolled her eyes, clicked her tongue, and made it clear to her mother that her opinion in this house was secondary, or maybe even last. Maybe you're not 100 years old, but you don't look 38, Juliana was rude. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? You look like an old woman. You've let yourself go, you don't dye your hair, don't do manicures, can't even use makeup properly. Have you seen Liliana La Cruz's mom? A beauty. She's 42, by the way, and looks as if she's not even 30. Marina remained silent, though she really wanted to speak out about Liliana La Cruz's mother. She had one daughter, a wealthy husband, which allowed her not to work and spend all day in SPA salons and shops, and she also had her own driver, cook, and housekeeper. In short, everything was set for Liliana's mother to only maintain herself in proper condition so that Liliana's father wouldn't go anywhere. Juliana, you know I can't afford beauty salons and masseurs, Marina tried to justify herself, although she felt foolish and ridiculous. It's just me, and there's also Grandma, who needs to pay for a caregiver and medications. I'm not to blame for not having a millionaire husband who would pay for all my beauty procedures. Juliana glanced at her mother and even put down the sandwich she was about to bite, but seemed to change her mind. Are you serious right now? Juliana chuckled. And whose fault is it that we live like paupers, that you work as a simple administrator in a third-rate hotel, that we live four people in a 40-square-meter apartment? I've seen your photos when you were young. You were beautiful. Why didn't you marry a decent man? Where is my father, who could have been like Liliana La Cruz's dad? Mom, why are you silent? Marina wanted to grab a cup and splash her daughter's face with the now-cold coffee. But Marina, being a mother of three, had long discovered the rule of ten. If you really wanted to do some thoughtless act that could lead to a scandal and trouble, you just had to mentally count to ten. While counting, nerves calmed down and the desire to commit a bold act faded away. The rule always worked, as it did this time. Let's not talk about your father now, Marina slowly said, trying to enunciate each word, twisting the cup with the remains of the coffee in her hands. You know your father was Victor, and he died three years ago. That's it. 
Victor was not my father, Juliana rudely replied, again forcing her mother to use the rule of ten. Even though I was only five when you met and started living together, it doesn't mean that I don't have other memories. Victor, he's the father of Isabella and Antonio, but he has nothing to do with me, so don't attribute to me what doesn't concern me. Marina sighed, understanding that arguing with her daughter was pointless. Every day, Juliana was getting older. She became more daring, rude, and arrogant. This wasn't the girl she used to be, and Marina saw in her elder daughter an exact copy of Sonora Girona, Juliana's paternal grandmother, who had never seen her granddaughter and never would, just as Juliana would never see her grandmother. Each year, the girl resembled Sonora Girona more and more, and Marina dreaded that one day her daughter might turn into the same monster her failed mother-in-law had been. Victor raised you from the age of five and for eight years considered himself your father. That's his problem, Juliana defiantly replied. I never considered him my father, never called him dad, and he knew it very well. Mom, why do you always tell me my father is Victor? Both you and I know that's not true. Because we were a family, Marina tried to explain. Don't make me laugh, Juliana laughed artificially. What family? He cheated on you, and you turned a blind eye. You thought we were a family. Marina felt a surge of anger again. Every word from her eldest daughter felt like a blow. It seemed as if Juliana was deliberately trying to hurt her mother with her words, as if these humiliating words brought her special pleasure. Marina looked at her daughter, unable to believe she was hearing these words from her own child, her beloved daughter, for whom she had fought so long for the right to live. Arguing with Juliana was pointless. At 16, Juliana was convinced she knew more about life than her mother. The eldest daughter saw Marina as a failure who hadn't achieved anything in life. Having given birth to three children, left without a man by her side, with a lousy job, and stuck caring for a sick mother-in-law, Marina had no authority over Juliana. Every word she said was taken as an affront, a reason for Juliana to insult her mother or to start a heated argument. That morning was no different. When Juliana and Isabella came out of the bathroom, Marina had already set the table with three bowls of porridge, sliced bread, and poured milk into glasses. Ew, warm milk again. Juliana made a face and pushed the glass away, a gesture followed by her younger sister. Only Antonio eagerly devoured his porridge, munching it down with bread and butter, washing it down with milk. It's not warm, it's from the fridge, Marina replied in a no-nonsense voice. Juliana's challenging behavior and her demonstration of it in front of her younger sister began to irritate Marina again. Isabella adored Juliana, and Marina feared that the younger daughter would consider her older sister a role model. Perhaps Juliana had some aspects worth emulating, but certainly not her attitude and manner of speaking to her mother. Mom, it is warm, Juliana countered. And the porridge is all clumpy. Cooking is just not your thing. Marina clenched her teeth, then suddenly decided she was tired of tolerating Juliana's complaints. Without a word, she walked to the table, removed the bowl of porridge and the glass of milk that were next to Juliana. Juliana's face stretched in surprise. You're going to leave me without breakfast? She asked sarcastically. Marina looked at her daughter questioningly. What should I do? Cook a separate dish for you while everyone else quietly eats their porridge and risks being late for kindergarten and school? If you cooked properly, we wouldn't have to waste time and waste food, Juliana snapped back. If you're not satisfied with my cooking, get up and cook yourself. Set your alarm for six in the morning and then serve us all first, second courses, and a glass of as cold milk as you wish. Why are you looking at me like that? Surprised by such a suggestion? Juliana abruptly jumped up from the table and disappeared into her room. Isabella, who had been silently observing the latest conflict between her mother and older sister, stirred her spoon in her bowl but managed to swallow only a spoonful of porridge. Marina, angered by her eldest daughter, took Isabella's bowl away, throwing it into the sink with a clatter, then commanded, Get ready to leave. Isabella, you'll eat in kindergarten, and you, Antonio, stop eating bread. 
You're on your third slice. Your pants will soon burst at the seams. The son glanced at his mother disapprovingly, but continued chewing. Marina, having seen the children off, leaned tiredly against the refrigerator and closed her eyes. It was half past eight in the morning, and she was already exhausted and drained. Where to find the strength to work 12 hours, then run to the store, cook dinner, check Antonio's homework, put Isabella to bed, and prepare for another challenging day. They left the house together. It took Marina about five minutes to warm up the car before they drove away. Drop me off at Central, Juliana said, and Marina looked at her daughter in surprise. Why? Do you want to stop by the store? Juliana shook her head. I don't want my classmates to see what kind of clunker we ride in. Our car is fine, Antonio argued from the back seat, and Marina smiled slightly at her son, looking at him in the rearview mirror. It's not a car, it's a clunker, Juliana retorted. If you like riding in it, please do. If you don't like it, don't ride. We was never forcing you, Antonio replied, and Juliana laughed. First learn how to talk, smart guy. Who says we was? How are you not repeating a year with such knowledge? Marina gripped the steering wheel, counting to ten in her head again. Juliana was becoming unbearably intolerable. She wanted to shake her daughter to get all the nonsense out of her head. When had she become like this? If she was spewing venom in all directions at 16, what would happen later? I'm not stupid, Antonio said hurt. You're my smart boy, she reassured her son. Then she saw a sarcastic smirk on her eldest daughter's face. Juliana couldn't keep quiet. Did you tell all your men the same? Considered them all smart and they treated you like the last scoundrels? Marina pressed the brake sharply and the car halted. She turned to her mother, her eyes sparkling with anger. On purpose, right? Get out of the car. What? Juliana's eyes widened. Where to get out? The bus stop is 20 meters away. Get on the bus and go to school. I don't want to hear or see you anymore. You've worn me out so much this morning that I can't stand being so close to you. You're kicking me out into the cold just because you don't like hearing the truth? Juliana's voice trembled with indignation. The truth. Who said you're speaking the truth? Who made you the ultimate arbiter of truth? Go to hell. Juliana yelled, then grabbed her school backpack and flew out of the car, slamming the door behind her. Marina looked back and saw her youngest daughter's eyes filled with confusion and tears. Isabella, what's wrong? The mother tried to smile, but the smile was strained and unnatural. Don't worry, everything's fine. Why did you kick Juliana out? Isabella asked, her lower lip trembling. Marina felt nauseous at the sight of her youngest daughter's mood, but she couldn't tolerate Juliana's antics anymore. How much longer could she behave like this? How long would Juliana allow herself to speak to Marina in such a tone? Marina, exhausted from the constant struggle with everyday life, mounting problems, lack of money, and mistakes of the past, suddenly felt utterly drained. She had no one to share her burdens with as her life and relationship with her daughter crumbled. All her friends were more or less settled. Her mother had long passed away, and her sister, living in another city, only shared dry updates about life during their occasional calls. Isabella, I didn't kick Juliana out. She decided to take the bus herself, Marina replied, trying to make her voice soft. She really didn't want her youngest daughter to end up like her elder sister. If that happened, Marina would indeed consider herself a failure, unable to accomplish the simple task of raising her children to be decent people. You were yelling at her, and it's cold outside, Isabella responded, sniffing. Juliana is always yelling at mom, Antonio defended Marina, and she gratefully looked at her son. Indeed, she hadn't been lucky with her elder daughter, but her son was a wonderful child. Glancing at the clock, Marina gasped. Time was pressing. She needed to drop the kids at the kindergarten and school, then navigate through traffic to get to work in the city center. Somehow managing to complete all the morning's tasks, Marina rushed into the hotel and barely made it to the reception desk. 
You're unbelievable. Her co-worker exclaimed. It's almost nine. Do you want the she-devil to fire you? Marina shook her head, panting and unwinding the scarf around her neck. They both referred to their boss as the she-devil. She hated tardiness and any other breach of work discipline. Her main threat was immediate dismissal or disciplinary action, which inevitably affected the monthly bonus. Marina, whose financial situation heavily depended on this bonus, went out of her way to avoid any disciplinary action. I barely found a parking spot, Marina attempted to justify herself, then suddenly decided there was no need for excuses. She hadn't been late for work, so there was no reason to explain her timely arrival. As soon as she changed into her uniform and stood behind the reception desk, the she-devil appeared at the entrance. After giving Marina and her co-worker Dora a sharp look, she glanced at the clock and nodded in greeting. Both women exhaled in relief and Dora prepared to leave for home. Marina, who had arrived at work just 10 minutes ago, enviously watched her co-worker. She herself would have loved to go home now, clean up, cook a proper meal, do the laundry, and lounge in front of the TV with chips and juice. But no, a 12-hour workday lay ahead, followed by a hurried return home, grocery shopping, cooking, cleaning, arguments with Juliana, and attempts to keep herself together. After work, as planned, Marina stopped by the supermarket for groceries and headed home. It was almost 10 in the evening. The kids were probably not yet ready for bed despite the early rise. To her surprise, only Antonio and Isabella were at home. Where's Juliana? She asked routinely while unpacking the groceries. Mom, what's for dinner? Antonio asked impatiently, always hungry and fond of eating. Marina mentally calculated what healthy and quick meal she could whip up for dinner. But her thoughts kept returning to her elder daughter. Antonio, where's Juliana? Is she out? Antonio shrugged. Don't know. She brought Isabella back from daycare, then took a bag and left. Bag? Marina stood still. Why does she need a bag? What bag? The brown one, the one she used for the gym. Marina glanced at the clock, 2220. Where could her eldest daughter have gone, taking a sports bag with her, especially a spacious one? Antonio, what did she say? Nothing, she didn't tell me anything, grumbled Antonio. As if Juliana ever tells me anything. Marina grabbed her phone and dialed her daughter's number. The phone rang long, but Juliana was not in a hurry to pick up. Angry and cursing to herself, Marina was ready to ignore her own rule of ten and give her daughter a serious scolding when she got home. They had an understanding that Juliana was supposed to be home by ten in the evening, and if she was going to be late, she had to inform her mother. Juliana hadn't sent any messages, leaving Marina to guess and seethe with frustration. Her mood was ruined. Surely Juliana decided to teach her mother a lesson, flaunting her independence. After calling Issy Julianal times and not getting an answer, Marina was ready to panic. Snow began to fall outside, and Juliana, in sneakers and a coat, was somewhere out there, trying to prove something to her mother. Brett thought Marina to herself, mechanically preparing dinner and cursing herself for losing her temper that morning. She should have kept herself in check, knowing what her eldest daughter was like. At the start of midnight, having put Isabella to bed, Marina continued to call her elder daughter, internally horrified by the thoughts that came to her mind, imagining the worst scenarios. What if Juliana was kidnapped or got mixed up with a bad crowd? God forbid, she used something and now who knows where and in what condition she was. When Marina was about to call the police, a message arrived on her phone. Don't look for me. I'm at a friend's, wrote Juliana. Brief and uninformative. At which friend's? For how long? Whether her elder daughter was planning to come home at all and when, Marina could only guess. She dialed her daughter's number again, but only long beeps answered her. Which friend? Why aren't you spending the night at home? I'm tired of putting up with you and the life we live. I'll pick up Isabella from the kindergarten tomorrow, and you can sort out your own problems. 
Such a response, every word filled with anger and resentment. Juliana was perpetually dissatisfied with how they lived. Her friends, in her opinion, had much more than Marina could ever provide. No matter how hard the mother tried, no matter how she bent over backwards, her eldest daughter was always unhappy with what she had. Or rather, as Juliana believed, she had nothing, no new phone, no trips abroad, no father, no separate room, no fancy clothes. In short, everything a girl dreamed of and was persistently displayed on the internet. Retreating to the bathroom, Marina wept bitterly. She always tried to be a good mother, unlike her own parents. But something wasn't working out. Juliana despised her, considered her a failure and a bumbler. Decent men never crossed Marina's path. There were either married men seeking casual relationships or chronic alcoholics seeking dominance over a woman. Who needed a nearly 40-year-old woman with three kids? Juliana said this openly to her mother. And Marina, listening to her daughter, often thought Juliana was somewhat right. Exiting the bathroom, Marina encountered her son, Antonio, who was lingering in the corridor, surprising her. Why aren't you asleep? Marina asked worriedly. You were crying, right? Antonio looked concerned at Marina, and she suddenly realized. Of course, her red, tear-streaked eyes made it obvious to even a child that she wasn't just bathing or doing laundry. Son, go to bed, Marina said kindly, trying to pat Antonio's head, but he stepped back and looked at her intently. You were crying because of Juliana, right? He asked, and Marina just nodded and sighed heavily. Even to a ten-year-old, it was clear what was happening between her and her elder daughter. I worry about her, Marina replied. Suddenly, Antonio approached and hugged her tightly. Mom, don't cry because of Juliana. She's just mean, Antonio said, and Marina smiled sadly, hugging her son. She's just jealous of everyone, that's why she's so angry. She's not angry. She just lacks what others have. Antonio stepped back and shook his head. No, Mom, she has everything. What doesn't she have? She has a home, food, you, me, and Isabella. What else does she need? A new phone? Probably, Marina chuckled. But I don't have the means to buy it for her. Then let her go and earn it herself, Antonio said resentfully. You're not obligated to buy her expensive phones. Let her work and earn. She talked about Liliana La Cruz, saying her mother makes her work so she can buy what she wants. Marina looked at her son in surprise. Liliana? Working? And where does she work? She distributes flyers in a shopping center, works at her father's company doing something with documents. He pays her for it, but Juliana thinks you should just buy her everything. That's not fair. You don't know where she's spending the night? Marina asked, hopeful. I don't know, Antonio replied. Maybe with her boyfriend. Marina's eyes widened. Boyfriend? Juliana has a boyfriend? Antonio nodded. Juliana thinks I don't understand anything, considers me stupid but I've seen her hugging a boy from the 11th grade. Mom, she thinks she's very grown up. That's why she talks to you like that. Thinks I'm stupid, thinks you're stupid. Even thinks Isabella is stupid. But that's not fair. We're not stupid. Of course not, Marina responded, becoming even more worried. Learning that her elder daughter had a boyfriend was a surprise to Marina. Maybe Antonio made it up or assumed Juliana had a boyfriend just because he saw her hugging someone? It didn't necessarily mean Juliana had something serious with a boy older than her. Marina tossed and turned all night, unable to sleep. In the morning, she woke up exhausted and weary, as if she hadn't closed her eyes at all. Mechanically washing up, preparing breakfast for the kids, dropping them off at daycare and school, she couldn't stop thinking about her daughter. If she could turn back time and change something, Marina would do everything possible to ensure her elder daughter wasn't so mean, envious, overly independent, and thinking herself better than others. What's wrong with you? 
Her colleague asked as Marina arrived at the reception desk in the morning. You look like a tractor ran over you all night. Honestly, I feel just like that, Marina replied, then saw her reflection in the hotel lobby mirror and almost gasped. Dark circles under her eyes, even deeper wrinkles, disheveled hair. All because of some 16-year-old girl who thought she was too grown up. Maybe take a sick day? The boss will have a fit if she sees you like this. I'll have some coffee and be fine, Marina responded. The coffee didn't help. Fatigue kept overwhelming her, her eyes kept closing. Marina yawned constantly and kept glancing at the clock, hoping the hands would move faster and this terrible workday would end sooner. She wanted to call Juliana's class teacher to check if her elder daughter attended school, but her boss prohibited using phones during work and Marina was afraid to risk disciplinary action and potentially lose her bonus. What's wrong with you today? The boss addressed her just as Marina yawned heartily, sure no one was watching. Quickly covering her mouth, Marina felt her face flush. Sorry, Sonora Darius, she apologized guiltily, trying to gauge from her boss's face if she was about to lose her bonus or be fired for an innocent yawn. Just tired. You're not even 40 to be this tired midday, her boss said sternly. Are you aware the guest from room 305 hasn't checked out yet? and it's already past noon? Marina felt a chill. Indeed, it was almost 1.30 p.m., and she had forgotten about the problematic guest, who arrived drunk the night before and was clearly going to be trouble. Sorry, Sonora Darius, I'll fix it right now. Of course, you will, her boss glared at her disapprovingly. And if I hadn't reminded you, what then? He would have slept in and left the room without paying for another day. I'm not happy with how you've been working lately. Get yourself together, or I'll advocate for your dismissal. No, Marina could not afford to lose her job. Being jobless with three kids and a sick mother-in-law was unthinkable. In their small town, finding a decent job with a stable and fairly good income was a real challenge. Marina hurried to room 305, struggled to wake the sleeping guest, and then spent about an hour explaining that he needed to pay for the extra stay. No way. He scoffed, shaking his head. It's not my fault I wasn't woken up. That's your problem, not mine. I won't pay. The boss was furious upon learning the guest had checked out almost at 3 p.m. without agreeing to pay for the extra day. Marina sobbed, enduring unpleasant words from her boss, who decided to deduct the cost of the additional stay from Marina's salary. But that's 100 euro. Marina realized that was about what she earned per shift. He only stayed three extra hours. The new guest hasn't arrived yet. The room will be cleaned in time. Let me at least pay for his stay by the hour. No, Sonora Darius cut her off. I'm not doing this to be nasty, but to make you take your responsibilities more seriously. After your shift, come to my office and write a statement for the deduction of 100 euro from your salary. Marina broke down, crying in front of her boss. Where was the justice? Why was everything so unbearably difficult today? Her daughter, work problems, emotional turmoil. Where to find the strength to endure all these troubles without breaking down? That evening, Juliana again didn't come home, although she picked up her younger sister from daycare as promised. Isabella couldn't tell much about Juliana, where her sister had picked her up, how she looked, or her mood. Antonio only informed his mother that Juliana had grabbed some more of her things, meaning the defiant girl had no intention of returning home. Marina spent the evening calling her daughter, who demonstratively didn't answer. Desperate to reach her, Marina went to the school in the morning to talk to Juliana's teacher and at least catch a glimpse of her daughter. Juliana hasn't been to school for three days, the teacher shrugged. I thought she was sick. Marina was stunned, not expecting such an answer. It turned out Juliana had abandoned not only her family, but also her studies. Sonora Tejeda, do you know where your daughter is? The teacher asked, and Marina, crying took a tissue from her. She left home, Marina sobbed. We have a difficult situation at home. Juliana is completely out of control. 
Then I'll have to report this to the principal, the teacher said, but Marina looked at her pleadingly. Please, Sonora Vasquez, don't say anything. I'll find my daughter. I'll do everything to reason with her. I beg you, help me. The teacher softened. All right, but you need to resolve the issue with your daughter by the end of the week. If the school learns I knew about your family problems and didn't report it to the principal, I'll be in trouble. Marina nodded, her mind racing with thoughts of what to do next. Where to go? What to do? How to act? She took her phone and, instead of calling her daughter, sent a message, if you don't show up at school tomorrow, child services might take you away. Is that what you want? A few minutes later, she received a reply from her daughter, I'll come to school, but only because I don't want to be returned to you. She wrote the word you in capital letters, highlighting the person because of whom Juliana had left home. Marina waited for the next class break and found Juliana's friend Liliana among the crowd of students. Is Juliana with you? Aunt Marina, don't interrogate me, the girl waved her off. Sort out your problems with your daughter yourself and don't drag me into it. Okay, I won't. Marina was ready to promise anything just to know the truth about her elder daughter's whereabouts. Just tell me where she lives. I won't go there, but I'll feel more at ease. Don't you understand what it's like to lose a child? You haven't lost Juliana, Liliana shrugged. She left on her own. And you know, I can understand her. You don't give her a life with your commands. Me? Marina was taken aback. What has she told you? Liliana, don't be silent. Sorry, Aunt Marina, I have a class starting soon, and Juliana isn't staying with me, so don't look for her there. And she's not staying with a girl. Marina leaned against the cool wall and closed her eyes. Her daughter, at 16, apparently thought she was too grown up. Living with some guy who would probably turn out to be a complete scoundrel. What was going on in Juliana's head? What was she living for? What was she thinking? At that moment, Marina had got a call from her mother-in-law's caretaker. She was there on Marina's work days every other day. Today was Marina's day off, and she was supposed to go to Sonora Nogues's and relieve the caretaker. With school and worries about Juliana, Marina had completely lost track of time. Anna, I'm on my way, Marina almost yelled into the phone. Hang on for 40 minutes. I'll stop at the pharmacy and be there. Sonora Tejeda, the woman's voice was firm, we had an agreement. I have my own things and plans too. Marina sighed. As if problems with work and her daughter weren't enough, now the caregiver's dissatisfaction too. Of course, Anna could be understood. Marina didn't pay her much, but the woman cooked, cleaned, washed, treated bed sores, gave injections, and even partly rehabilitated Sonora Nogues, who had lost feeling in her legs after a stroke two years ago. Anna was waiting for Marina in the hallway, ready to rush off. Sonora Tejeda, please don't do this again. Marina apologized, paid the helper, then went to the room where her mother-in-law lay. The apartment reeked of sickness and medicine. It was always hard for Marina to be there. Sonora Nogues was in bed reading a book and weakly smiled at Marina. Hello, daughter. Hello, Sonora Nogues. How are you feeling? My dear, nothing has changed in the two days you've been away. Sonora Nogues' speech function had almost completely recovered, unlike her legs. The stroke had paralyzed her, rendering the lower part of her body non-functional. She couldn't stand, move, use the toilet, or bathe without assistance and was essentially bedridden. Anna, whom Marina had found with great difficulty among other caregivers, was the only one who agreed to work two days on, two days off. She did all the household chores but didn't stay overnight with Sonora Nogues. Anna would come in the morning and leave in the evening. However, if Sonora Nogues needed help, she would call her caregiver, who lived just two doors down, and she would arrive promptly. Marina changed her mother-in-law's bed, helped her to the bathroom where Sonora Nogues could wash herself more independently, and then they settled in the kitchen for coffee. The mother-in-law sat in a wheelchair, which she used to move around the house. 
but the size of the rooms and inconvenient doorways made it impossible for her to move around the apartment alone. When Anna or Marina was there, they would seat Sonora Nogues in the chair and transport her around the apartment themselves. However, there were issues with outdoor walks. The building wasn't equipped with ramps, and Sonora Nogues lived on the fourth floor. Her outdoor excursions were limited to being wheeled out to the narrow balcony, where she would read books or simply watch passers-by. How nice it is when you come, Sonora Nogues said joyfully to Marina, who smiled tiredly in response. Anna tries, but she's still a stranger and doesn't approach caring for me as tenderly as you do. You wash me, have coffee with me, and chat about life. Anna is just not very sociable, you know, replied Marina. She has a troubled son. She's all worried about him. She only took this job because she wants to help her son. Yes, better a troubled son than no son at all, Sonora Nogues said sadly, then shook her head. Let's not talk about the bad. How are the children? How's Isabella? How's Antonio? Marina mentally noted that her mother-in-law again only asked about the younger children. Juliana didn't seem to exist for Sonora Nogues. After all, she was Marina's child with another man, essentially a stranger to the elderly woman. She rarely asked about Marina's eldest daughter, and Juliana had never visited Sonora Nogues since her stroke. Now, the mother-in-law was only interested in Marina's children with Victor, not mentioning Juliana at all. Marina thought it might be for the best. The less her mother-in-law knew about what was happening in their home, the better for her health. Everything's fine, Sonora Nogues, Marina responded evasively. Antonio is studying, Isabella goes to kindergarten, and she's already preparing for New Year's. She'll be a snowflake or a squirrel again. How delightful. Sonora Nogues' lips stretched into a smile. My little girl will be performing on stage. It's a pity I can't see her. I'll record it on camera and show you later, answered Marina. Sonora Nogues, would you like to go out on the balcony for some fresh air? I'll dress you warmly and will you out. What do you think of that idea? The mother-in-law agreed. Marina carefully dried her hair with a hairdryer, dressed her in warm pants and a sweater, tied a scarf around her, and then wheeled the chair out onto the balcony. It wasn't cold outside, and even less so on the balcony, but Marina didn't want to take any risks and expose the sick woman to another danger catching a cold. In her condition, any illness was akin to a disaster, and Marina had enough other problems already. Sitting in the room and watching Sonora Nogues' thin body curiously peeking out at the street, observing passers-by, Marina thought about how much her life had changed over the last three years. Just three years ago, she had no idea what awaited her. Not to mention, she didn't know what was happening with her own husband, whom she loved and to whom she remained faithful. On the dresser in Sonora Nogues' room, there were still wedding photos of Victor and Marina. The newlyweds were happy in them. Back then, Marina truly believed they had a long and cloudless life ahead, and all the hardships and problems seemed already overcome. Do you love me? Victor would ask all the time. And Marina, smiling happily, nodded to him, kissed him, cuddled up to his shoulder, and felt like she was in a fairy tale. Of course, she had her prince beside her. A man who wasn't afraid to marry a woman with a child, who knew about his bride's complicated past and was ready to accept her as she was. I think I've never loved anyone like this, Marina would reply to him, while feeling not entirely honest. Did she really love Victor more than her first man, who left a deep scar on her heart? Marrying Victor, Marina tried to convince herself that it was true. Her husband would be her first and only lawful spouse, with whom she would definitely have children and with whom they would live a long and happy life. Is it just a thought, or are you sure? Victor would ask jealously. And Marina laughed, thinking that if her husband was so jealous, then his love must be equally strong. How lucky she was, with her husband, his mother, and the way their life was settling down. Marina met Victor 11 years ago. Her daughter Juliana was five then, and Marina, 
tired of being alone and no longer believing in true feelings and strong relationships, unexpectedly realized that her heart, which seemed locked up tight, began to slowly open up. Victor was very persistent in his courtship. After meeting Marina, he saw no barriers in his path. I have a child, Marina warned. But for Victor, the presence of a beloved five-year-old daughter was not an obstacle. So what? Do you think that if a woman has a child, she no longer has the right to happiness with a man? I don't believe that I can be happy with a man, she answered, trying to be as honest as possible and talk about everything that weighed on her heart. Believe me, you can. He smiled, showered Marina with flowers and compliments, found a way to Juliana's heart, and now they spent more time together. For Marina, this was very important. The man she loved and to whom she opened her heart communicated so well with her daughter. Marina was cautious about getting into a relationship with Victor. She observed him, trying not to repeat the mistakes she had made before meeting him. However, the situation changed when she realized she was pregnant. I'm pregnant, Marina informed Victor about her delicate condition. She herself was lost, not at all ready for a new motherhood. But now it was about more than just giving birth to a new person, but also about creating a new family with Victor. I'm so happy. The man replied, and joy, ecstasy, and anticipation of the most wonderful thing were indeed reflected in his eyes. I wanted a child. I want you to give birth to a son for me. And if it's a daughter? Marina asked fearfully, but then saw the joyful sparkle in Victor's eyes. Then we'll have a daughter first, and then a son, he confidently replied. The couple got married, and Marina, along with her daughter Juliana, moved from the dormitory at the sewing factory, where she worked as a seamstress, to Victor's apartment. I don't want you to work at the sewing factory, Victor said. It's hard there, and you're pregnant. It's not easy to find a job in the city, Marina replied. Where would I go, especially pregnant? You'll go to our construction company, Victor confidently answered. Marina's face stretched in astonishment. Construction is better for a pregnant woman than a sewing factory? He laughed. I'm not asking you to go to the construction site itself. My director needs an assistant during his main employee's maternity leave. You need a good and calm job, and my boss needs a secretary. You won't have to do anything complicated. Just register documents and serve coffee to visitors. It's no more difficult than what you're doing now. Marina didn't resist. Besides, the salary Victor mentioned was almost twice what she was earning at the factory. The employment contract was temporary, but it so happened that Marina was supposed to go on maternity leave right when the main employee was planning to return from her leave. See, everything happened just in time, Victor rejoiced. You'll earn money, the boss will be happy, and you'll get paid for your maternity leave. Marina truly couldn't believe that things could work out like this. For over five years, she lived without hoping to meet a good man who would take care of her and her child. And then not only did such a man appear in her life, but also a new job, a separate apartment, and a reasonable mother-in-law. Sonora Noakes, no less than Victor, awaited the birth of her first grandchild. Victor was her only son, so the birth of his child was a very important event for the future grandmother. Antonio was born, and Marina immersed herself in maternal cares and chores. She already knew what it was like to have a small child, so there were no particular difficulties with the baby. Sonora Noggs helped her, and Victor worked a lot to save money for a larger apartment. We're cramped in a one-bedroom, he reasoned. I think in a year or two we can afford to buy a two-bedroom, then a three-bedroom, and have another baby. Marina smiled happily. She felt content with Victor, feeling calm and at ease. He resolved all problems without creating new ones. As he had planned, in two years, he earned enough for the family to move into a new two-bedroom apartment, and then Victor talked about having another child. Are you sure, Victor? Marina asked with doubt in her voice. I'd love to go back to work. I've been home since Antonio was born. I think I'd be more useful if I worked. You're already working, her husband replied. 
as my wife, the mother of our children, and the lady of the house. While Antonio is sick, you can stay home with him. No need to ask for leave from your boss. I earn enough. You can keep managing the household. After having another baby, we'll discuss your job. Marina didn't argue with her husband. She had gotten used to Victor making all the important decisions in their family. He brought in the money, wisely allocated the budget. It was entirely thanks to him that Marina and the kids had everything they needed. Sonora Noakes played a significant role in this decision. She was still working at the time, managing to help her son's family both financially and by babysitting. When it became clear that Marina was expecting a third child, everyone was happy, well, almost everyone except Juliana. Why do we need another child? She asked. I don't even have my own room. Antonio and I share one, and now you're breeding another child. It's an animal breeding, Victor interrupted his stepdaughter's reasoning. Children are planned. Remember that for the future, so you know how to speak correctly. What difference does it make how to speak correctly, the 10-year-old Juliana protested, if we're all living on top of each other? And you're planning to have another baby. Just because you like living like this doesn't mean everyone else does too. Marina didn't argue with her husband or daughter. She went with the flow, fulfilling her duties, remaining faithful to Victor, and willing to do anything just to keep him by her side and support their family. Isabella was born, and from that moment, something in the family changed. Marina saw Juliana becoming more dissatisfied day by day, for some reason unknown to her, Victor becoming more distant. It became difficult to please everyone and be good for all. Marina found out about Victor's affair only after his death. He was returning from work, driving, with another woman by his side. Later, after the car accident, Marina learned that Victor had not been at work that evening but with his constant mistress. Her name was Maria, and she died with Victor that evening. Additionally, Maria was pregnant, planning to divorce her husband, and Victor intended to leave his family for her. He never got to do it, and Marina learned the truth about her husband's personal life from this woman's husband, with whom Victor had a long-standing affair. Victor's death was a real shock for Marina. Besides being left without her husband and main financial support, she also learned disturbing details of his life. I knew everything, Marina's mother-in-law confessed 40 days after Victor's funeral. About this Maria, that she was pregnant and that he was planning to leave for her. Why didn't you tell me? Marina asked, feeling betrayed again, this time by her deceased husband's mother. First his death, then the news of his infidelity, and now her mother-in-law's words. It all seemed like a world when she might never escape from. Because I was against it, Sonora Nogues replied. I tried to reason with Victor, urged him to change his mind, considering he had children, responsibilities. He swore he wouldn't abandon the kids, but he couldn't leave Maria either. God punished him, me, and Maria. And what about me? Wasn't I punished? Marina cried, feeling almost out of tears. Forty days of horror, learning new details about her husband's secret life every day, and now her mother-in-law's words. You were just a victim of circumstances, her mother-in-law said. Sonora Nog struggled heavily with her only son's death. Victor's demise greatly affected her, leading her to quit her job, stay home, cut off contact with friends and grandchildren, and within less than a year, she suffered a stroke. Marina managed to find a job as a hotel administrator. In their city, job prospects were grim. The sewing factory where she had worked shut down, and all decent, well-paying positions were taken by others. Without significant work experience or higher education, it was challenging for her. The first few months after Victor's death, Marina and her family lived on his savings, but soon money became tight and Marina started job hunting. That's how she ended up at the hotel reception desk and her mother-in-law became bedridden. Even three years after becoming a widow, Marina struggled to settle and restart her life. She felt burdened with her eldest daughter adding fuel to the fire. Constantly short on money, she had no hope of finding happiness with a man again. After Victor, 
who seemed so perfect but turned out to be a deceitful adulterer, how could she trust other men and hope that life would eventually get better? Sonora Nogza's knocking on the balcony door brought Marina back from her heavy thoughts. Marina had been looking at the wedding photo, which no longer held any special value. She then wheeled her mother-in-law back from the balcony with some effort. What's interesting on the street? Marina asked routinely, helping Sonora Nogues take off her warm clothes. Nothing much. Some old ladies are sitting on a bench, gossiping. If I were healthy, I'd be sitting with them downstairs, collecting gossips. Marina didn't respond. She was eager to go home. There were many chores to do, changing the bed linen, doing Essie Juliana loads of laundry, preparing dinner, and lunch for the next day. Juliana used to help her a bit, but now she lived an unknown life with unknown people, leaving Marina with no hope for assistance. Shall I go, Sonora Nogues? Marina asked, and her mother-in-law nodded sadly. Of course, go. You have a day off. You've helped me, fed me, bathed me, and taken me out. Come back tomorrow. Marina said goodbye to her mother-in-law and headed home. The car kept jerking, the revs fluctuating. Marina knew it needed repairs. How much longer could she drive her old car before it broke down in the middle of the street? Calling a tow truck and taking it to a service station meant new expenses, not planned in a single mother's modest budget. My dear, just hold on, Marina coaxed her car. Hold on until the advance payment, then I'll take you to the doctors. She knew it wouldn't last until December. The car needed new spark plugs, oil, and a battery. Marina's mind raced with a list of necessary car repairs and expenses, making her head spin. There was no extra money and no sign of any coming, yet the car was her only means of transport. Without it, she'd have to use buses or taxis, costly given the number of daily trips she needed to make. As expected, the car wouldn't start the next morning. Fortunately, it was Saturday, her day off, so no need to drive to school or daycare. But she had to get the car to a garage and visit her sick mother-in-law. Marina took out a box where she saved money for emergencies, sighing heavily at the thought of how much would now go on car repairs. No new winter coat or boots this year. She had to make do with the old ones, but that was a minor issue compared to the impending days without a car. How would she get to school and daycare, then rush to work? How to visit her mother-in-law? What if she suddenly needed money? Luckily, a compassionate neighbor, who had observed Marina struggling with her car in the mornings, offered to tow her car to the mechanics. Gratefully accepting, she soon left the car with the mechanics and took a taxi to her mother-in-law's. That evening, having finished her chores, Marina decided it was time to look for a new job. Perhaps she could work every other day elsewhere or clean offices in the evenings. There was no spare money, but she was desperate to provide for her children. She browsed job ads online, updated her resume, and sent it out. She had a few options, an administrator at a restaurant, a household goods salesperson, a housekeeper in a country house, apparently for cleaning a large area for a negligent owner. Feeling a sense of duty fulfilled, Marina started cooking when she suddenly heard someone open the front door. Both Antonio and Isabella were home, so Marina had no doubt it was Juliana. And indeed, there stood her eldest daughter in the hallway with her bag, sullen and clearly unhappy about having to come home. Hello, Marina decided not to make a scene. After all, what was the point if Juliana would find a hundred counterarguments to her own? Hello, Juliana grumbled, taking off her coat. Thought I wouldn't come back? Marina shook her head. I waited for you every minute. Are you hungry? Juliana looked at her mother with a hunted expression. On one hand, Marina felt sorry for her daughter. Having tried to assert her independence and adulthood, Juliana turned out to be just a little, helpless girl, forced to return home. On the other hand, it was bound to happen, as starting an independent life at 16, unprepared for such life, was foolish and rash. Juliana was only mature and smart in words, but far from adulthood and wisdom in reality. 
That evening, the family dined together, and for the first time in S.E. Julianal days, Marina felt calm despite the many challenges ahead. Antonio kept glancing at his older sister, who was silent, not being rude to her mother, and not making remarks to anyone. In the morning, Marina woke up in a less depressed mood than in recent days. Even the appearance of her boss at the registration desk didn't spoil her positive mood. Go to the accounting department to write a statement about the deduction, reminded Sonora Darius, and Marina just nodded in response. There was no hope that the boss would forget about the incident with the sleeping guest. But after lunch, Marina received a call from a restaurant inviting her for an interview. Maybe now the bad streak will finally end, Marina thought, giving her strength and hope. She agreed with the restaurant's director to visit them the next day after nine. Now she had to figure out how to prepare dinner and supervise the children before school and daycare. I'll take care of everything, Juliana told her mother in the evening when Marina informed about the interview. You can go without worrying. Marina was surprised. Juliana was somewhat sad and not as aggressively inclined as usual. What had happened in the days she was away? Maybe her young man, with whom she lived, had hurt her. Marina could ask Juliana about it, but she dared not. What if her daughter flared up again and the fragile peace restored in the family over the last day collapsed as easily as it was rebuilt? Thank you, Juliana, Marina replied, looking at her eldest daughter with gratitude. The next day's snowfall suddenly disrupted all plans. Calling a taxi in the evening after work proved to be a real problem, and Marina, who had so hoped for a new job, suddenly realized she might not even get a chance to make a good impression. Moreover, her replacement was late due to the weather, so there was very little time left, worsening an already bleak situation. Rushing out to the street, Marina wrapped herself in her coat and covered her head with a scarf to protect from the gusts of wind, trying to catch a ride. Naturally, this trip was going to cost a penny, but she couldn't risk losing additional income. She might not even get the job, but being called for an interview was already a huge step towards escaping poverty. Cars, as if by spite, kept passing by. Nobody wanted to do a good deed in such weather, even for money. Excuse me, do you know the bus schedule? Marina turned and saw an elderly man addressing her. At first, she didn't realize he was talking to her, but there was no one else around who he could be talking to. Scanning him, Marina realized the old man was dressed completely inappropriately for the weather, an ancient jacket that had seen better days, a cap, shoes with thin soles. Where did he come from in this place and at this time? Senor, the buses aren't running anymore, it's too late, Marina replied. Almost half past nine in the evening. Now you can only get there by taxi. Taxi? The old man looked at her skeptically. And how do I find this taxi? You call a number, but there are no cars. I've tried. I'm so cold, the old man complained, and Marina looked at him in surprise. Of course. In such weather and dressed like that. No wonder he was cold. I need to meet my son. I promised to meet him at the station. I got on the wrong bus, then realized I had arrived in the center. How do I get to the station now? Marina was about to tell him she couldn't help, but just then a car stopped beside her. Where do you need to go? The driver asked. First to the station, then to the star restaurant. How much will it cost? Marina, looking at the old man, confidently answered. Give me 20, replied the driver, and Marina inwardly cursed. So much money for a 15-minute drive. She had no choice and carefully helped the old man into the back seat, then sat next to him. I only have two euro, the old man complained, rummaging in his jacket pocket. I'll pay. You get out at the station and I'll go on. But I can't do that. The old man protested. It's not fair. Let me give you two euro now and then another eight, so it's equal. Let's just drive and not distract the driver from the road. No, that won't do. The old man reached into his pocket again. I want to pay for the ride. Let's not pay for the ride right now, because you might still need the money. 
Marina decided not to argue with the elderly man, having long realized that arguing with people of age is pointless and dangerous for their nervous system. I'll give you my address, and you can bring me the money when you can. Your son is coming to you, right? He can bring me the money later. The old man reluctantly agreed. Marina scribbled her address on a piece of paper from her notebook, stuffed the note into the old man's jacket pocket, then glanced at her watch and sighed in relief. There was enough time. After dropping off the random passenger at the station building, Marina waved goodbye to him. Perhaps this good deed would bring her luck with the job. The outcome of the interview was uncertain, but she really liked the restaurant, the work conditions, and especially the director. A pleasant 45-year-old woman had been very polite, explaining in detail Marina's job responsibilities, even agreeing that the potential administrator would work two days on, two days off. This works for us, she said, but we have other candidates. We'll contact you to inform you of the result. Marina nodded, still hopeful. She managed to catch a ride home again, spending half the amount of money as before, but still a significant sum for her modest budget. Mom, Juliana cooked paella. A pleased Antonio greeted Marina at the threshold. And it turned out tasty. Marina froze, not believing her ears. Her daughter, who usually only criticized her cooking, had suddenly prepared something herself. Marina didn't even know that her eldest daughter, soft-handed one, could cook at all. Juliana, is it true? Entering the kitchen, she saw her daughter standing by the sink with dirty dishes. Did you cook it all yourself? Well, how long could we wait for you? Juliana asked instead of answering. Isabella and Antonio were whining for food. I cooked it. Try it. Maybe you won't like it. Marina sat at the table, and a plate of paella appeared before her. Of course, it wasn't real paella, just rice mixed with vegetables and meat chunks, but it was progress nonetheless. Very tasty. Marina finished her portion in minutes. I was just driving home, wondering what to cook, and you. You're a gem. Juliana barely smiled, quickly suppressing it. Suddenly, Marina felt so light and calm that she wanted to jump from her chair and dance around the kitchen. To hell with financial difficulties and the lack of a personal life. She had such wonderful children. Even Juliana, with whom relationships seemed irreparably damaged, had suddenly cooked a good dinner and was no longer arguing with her mother. In the morning, Marina looked out the window and decided she didn't want to send the older kids to school or take the youngest daughter through the snow to daycare. Let's have a lazy day, she proposed, opening the curtains, and Isabella and Antonio clapped their hands in joy. Juliana was more reserved, but her face showed she was glad not to go anywhere or walk through the freshly fallen snow. Together, they made breakfast, ate together, and then lay on the couch in the living room, arguing about what to watch on TV. A cartoon. Isabella whined. Cartoons are for babies, argued Antonio. Let's watch a samurai movie. I'm just going to sit in the other room on the internet, grumbled Juliana, leaving for the bedroom. Marina, with great difficulty, persuaded the younger children to watch an animal movie, but on condition that after the movie, they would watch both a cartoon for Isabella and a samurai movie for Antonio. Just then, as they were finishing the cartoon, someone rang the doorbell. I'll get it, Juliana, emerging from the bedroom, headed to the door. Mom, it's for you, she called from the hallway, and Marina, surprised that someone had come to see her on a weekday, went to the hallway. Certainly, the last person she expected to see was the very old man she had paid the fare for to the station. How persistent he is, Marina thought to herself with a smirk, yet she smiled back at him. This time, the old man was dressed appropriately for the weather, a long, warm coat, a knitted hat, and boots with thick soles. Marina looked at him, marveling at how different his generation was from the current one. The man she had helped yesterday could have easily forgotten his promise and thrown away the address, but this elderly man had honestly kept his word. Come in. Why are you standing in the hallway? Marina tried to invite the old man in, but he shook his head no, and only then she noticed that there was someone else standing next to him in the dimly lit hallway. 
This is my son, Nicholas, the old man said proudly, and the man stepped forward. Seeing him, Marina swayed. This couldn't be happening. It was unbelievable. She looked at the man, unable to discern if this was a dream or reality. Nicholas, the man extended his hand to Marina, but it hung in the air. Marina, is that you? It's me, she replied, feeling her face drain of blood. Are you feeling unwell? He asked, stepping closer. But Marina just shook her head and helplessly looked at the old man. Come into the house, she said in a hoarse voice, then disappeared into the kitchen. She needed to catch her breath and organize her thoughts. Staring out the window, not turning around, she could feel Nicholas standing in the same room with her. She could hear his breathing. Marina even thought she could hear her heart pounding loudly in the silence. I never thought I'd meet you again, Nicholas broke the silence. Turning around, Marina saw him standing at the kitchen entrance, and then his father, who had sat down at the table. Neither did I. Juliana entered the kitchen, looking surprised at everyone present, then questioningly at her mother. Should I put the kettle on? She asked. Marina nodded. Nicholas quickly glanced at Juliana, then his gaze lingered on the girl. The question he wanted to ask hung in the air, but Marina understood exactly what Nicholas wanted to know. They had met 20 years ago, during their first year at the Civil Engineering Institute. Both were studying to be engineers and ended up in the same group. It was clear within a couple of months that there was something more between them than just friendship and fun. It was the first time Marina had truly fallen in love, seriously, so intensely that it made her cheeks flush just thinking about Nicholas. He too was in love and didn't hide his feelings from her. It seemed they had a happy future ahead, but no. A relationship between the son of the vice chancellor, Sonora Girona Girona, and some girl from a troubled family was not something Nicholas's mother approved of. You don't appeal to me, Sonora Girona declared on the first day she met Marina. Marina, in love with Nikolai, didn't take the woman's words seriously. Sure, the mother of an only son, she was protective of her child and wanted the best for him. Nikolai was 18, already an adult, able to make his own decisions, that's what Marina believed. She was sure of it. They dated in secret from Sonora Girona. Nikolai would visit Marina at her dorm, and she, skillfully hiding his visits from the warden, would take him to her room. Of course, Girona knew her son was continuing the romance with that girl, and it infuriated her, but she could do nothing. Nikolai would snap, be rude to his mother, but continued to see Marina. I love you, he would say, and Marina believed him. She was in her fifth year when she learned of her pregnancy. The doctor at the women's clinic, who examined her and informed her of her delicate condition, happened to be a friend of Sonora Girona and immediately reported to her that the provincial girl was pregnant with Nikolai's child. Here's some money, the woman said, appearing in Marina's room. Have an abortion. This will cover the procedure and moral compensation. Stay away from my son. I wasn't clinging to him. Marina tried to keep her cool. We love each other, and I'm not going to get rid of the baby. What a fool, blurted Sonora Girona. You're putting a noose around your neck. Do you know that Nick has someone else? My friend's daughter. A beautiful and very smart girl. He sleeps with you, but will marry her. Marina felt the blood drained from her face. That's not true, you're lying. The woman's face flushed with anger. I never lie to anyone, unlike you, by the way. You come from a family of drunks who only know how to lie to get a penny for a bottle. My son will not marry you. He just used you for fun. It's better if you take the money and do what I said. Or what? Marina challenged or I'll make sure you're expelled from the Institute, left without a job and means of subsistence. Marina shook her head. As soon as Sonora Girona left, she immediately called Nikolai. He didn't answer her calls and didn't show up at the Institute for the next few days. Later, she was told that Nikolai's grandmother fell ill and he had gone to capital. Marina tried calling him, 
but he initially didn't answer, and then she only heard the mechanical voice of the answering machine, the subscriber is temporarily unavailable. As threatened by Girona, Marina was expelled from the Institute for Disciplinary Violations. Sonora Girona did everything possible to make life miserable for the woman she disliked. Thus, Marina was left without a diploma, no longer able to live in the dormitory, but she had a healthy daughter whom she named after her grandmother. She hadn't seen Nikolai for 17 years. Now he stood in her kitchen next to his daughter, looking into Marina's face. Let's talk, he suggested. About what? She shrugged. So many years have passed. What do we have to talk about? At least about the fact that I might have a child. Having heard the conversation, Juliana flinched and looked at her mother. Marina decided there was no point in lying or withholding information. Everyone was grown up and fully understood that any lies would eventually surface. Yes. You have a daughter. Strange that for all 16 years of her life you weren't concerned. The old man sitting at the table, waiting for his coffee, looked anxiously at each person present. Son, what is this woman saying? Do you have a child? Your son has a child, Marina answered for Nikolai, a child that Sonora Girona so desperately didn't want to acknowledge or know. She did everything to ensure your son didn't know about his daughter's existence. Or maybe not everything, and Nikolai just didn't want to know. Marina felt tears treacherously well up in her eyes. She didn't want to fight them, nor did she want to lie or argue. She just wanted to bury herself under a blanket and hide from everything happening. I wanted, I knew. I only found out about it when I left for capital. My mother suddenly sent me to my grandmother's. I didn't even have time to say goodbye to you. She took my phone and then said she lost it. I believed her. I always believed my mother. I left. Through friends, I wanted to find out how you were doing, where you were, but you were no longer at the Institute. Later, before her death, my mother told me everything. She regretted what she had done. Marina, I wanted to find you, but I couldn't. Our town is too small to not be able to find me, Marina replied. But you, apparently, were not as persistent as your parents. Probably, Nikolai now looked at Juliana, and she didn't take her eyes off her father. But by then you were married, changed your surname, and finding you became impossible. And I realized it was too late to change anything. You had your life, I had mine, paths diverged. I got married five years after giving birth to Juliana. You had five years to find me and your daughter. All those five years, I knew nothing about having a daughter. Marina couldn't hold back anymore and burst into tears. Juliana rushed to her mother and embraced her shoulders. As tears flowed, it seemed Marina's hurt, anger, despair, and longing were being wrenched from her. An hour later, they all calmly sat at the table drinking coffee. The old man, who inadvertently caused the reunion, was silent, occasionally dabbing his eyes with a paper napkin. Nikolai watched Marina, and she averted her eyes. It was painful inside, but at the same time, she felt an incredible sense of relief, as if a massive avalanche periodically overwhelmed her. Her eldest daughter, suddenly grown up and changed, her younger children, who were still unaware of anything, and the once-loved man and father of her eldest daughter. For 17 years, Marina had lived a life that wasn't hers, and now she stood on the brink of major changes. She didn't yet know if the changes would be for the better or not, but she was sure she would no longer allow herself to be hurt. My mother confessed everything to me five years after we parted, Nikolai said. She was dying a difficult, prolonged illness, suffering not so much physically as morally, realizing that you had defied her and given birth to a child, meaning somewhere there was her only grandchild, a child she would never see. My mother deeply regretted what she had done to you, and most of all, she regretted that she would never be able to ask your forgiveness. Do you have any other children? Juliana asked Nikolai. Unfortunately, no. I was married, but it was never really genuine. All these years, I lived a life that wasn't mine, as if playing a role. I worked a lot, earned money, helped others, but couldn't help my own daughter. 
Probably, there is no forgiveness for me. There is, Juliana unexpectedly replied. We should always forgive, right, Mom? You'll forgive me too, for acting like a complete fool. I behaved like that and hated myself for it. But then I saw what other parents are like and realized that you're good. No, not just good, you're the best. Marina smiled through her tears. The phone rang. It was the director of the restaurant where Marina had an interview the day before. Sonora Tejeda, we are ready to offer you the job, she informed, and Marina nodded, not believing that all this was happening to her. Hello? Sonora Tejeda, can you hear me? Are you ready to start working? I am ready, she replied, thinking to herself that she was ready for everything, for a new job and for her new life. And if fate gave her a second chance and the opportunity to meet Nikolai again, it couldn't be meaningless. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.